tax extension in the county clerk's office. In this presentation, we're going to go over what the county clerk does, what documents we need to complete extension, when those documents are due, what's new to extension, and at the very end, we're going to do a sample extension with a taxing district. Today's agenda will encompass what we do at the county clerk's office, the tax extension timeline, what we need from you to complete extension, what's new to extension, and then we're going to have a sample extension at the end. What does the county clerk do? The county clerk handles a multitude of things, from elections to vital records, including birth records and death records, statement of economic interest, issuance of marriage licenses, tax redemption, and tax extension. Why bring this up? It's brought up because each election day, the office is closed. It's closed to any matter unless it's election related. Therefore, any birth record requests, any other vital record requests, statement of economic interest issues, tax redemption or tax extension questions will not be answered on that day. So please hold your questions for the day after, or you can go ahead and send them via email. We will not be answering any questions related to those matters on election day. The timeline. So extension really kicks off in December for us. That's when we receive your levy. Levies are due no later than the last Tuesday in December. But before that, obviously, you're going to be executing and issuing your budgets. And then you'll also be filing those with us as well. But December is the biggest one when we see your levy. That's when we start entering the numbers into the calculations. Then in January, we send out levy confirmations in the first week of that month. Levy confirmations are simply as what they are. They're confirming that we entered your levy correctly. Your corporate has exactly what it needs to have, your IMRF, your audit, whatever funds you have are correct. And it includes your bonds as well. Bonds will be listed on those levy confirmations. Just make sure everything is good with those and then sign off on them and send them back. If there is an issue, then of course, please reach out and let us know and we will correct the matter as quickly as possible. Then in March, March is when we get the EAVs or final EAVs from the county assessor. And EAVs are your equalized assessed values, meaning all of the different parcels within your taxing district have been accumulated for their value and minus any exemptions that those parcels might have. So that's when we're gonna get those in the first week of March. When that happens, we immediately send out, once it's we've balanced on our side, tax computation reports. And then along with those tax computation reports, you're also gonna see your PTEL worksheet if you are a PTEL district, and a PTEL reallocation, again, if you're a PTEL district. PTEL reallocation worksheet, that is the one that you can change your rates. Once we do the calculation and we make sure that you are within the limit, you don't get a PTEL reallocation. If you're over your limit, then you do get a reallocation sheet, meaning you can then change where we deduct that overage. So those are things that need to be looked over very quickly because we do expect a, a turnaround about a week and a half. And we understand that March is a time period where certain districts are off, specifically school districts for spring break. So when we do get the county assessor EAVs, we're gonna send out an email to all the people who are on our email list, letting you know when we got those EAVs and when we expect to be balanced and when we're going to send out the, all of those other worksheets. So you will be getting those from us around the first week of March as well. And then we're going to let you know when we're going to send out tax computations and then having those come back within like a week and a half. Then in April, the Illinois Department of Revenue sends us the final multiplier and then tax extension is finalized. It's turned over to the treasurer's office. And then in May, the treasurer's office balances and then creates and sends tax bills. After that, you're probably going to get your first distribution right after June. That's how quickly the timeline goes. So it is a quick turnaround. Obviously, if you have any questions, certainly let us know. We're here to help mm -hmm. at any time. What we need from you. So we certainly need your budget, which must be filed within 30 days of its adoption. And there's the state statute that mandates that. The other two items that must accompany your budget would be certification of budget with original signatures and seals and estimated source of revenue certified by your chief fiscal officer with original signatures and seals. Obviously, if you don't have a seal for your district, that's fine. Then we don't need it, but we would need the signature.
Then we have your tax levy, which again must be turned in by the last Tuesday in December. It's a very important timeline. There's the state statute that mandates that. Again, must have a certification of tax levy with original signatures and seals. Truth and taxation compliance form with original signatures and seals. Again, if you don't have a seal, that's perfectly fine. We just need that signature. You do need to turn in a truth and taxation compliance form. Some of you do not turn that in, but we do need that. Um, it could be a letter. It could be the form that we have. We have a blank form with options one through four. You can go ahead and get that from us if you need it. Uh, you just have to request it from us. We don't post it on our website because we don't like to put out as too much information for the public to get confused. Um, so that is something you'd have to request from us. You can email us at the tax extension at McHenryCountyIL.gov to get that form. More than happy to share that with you. Then we have the annual treasurer's report and the annual financial report or comptroller's annual financial report. People call it the AFR. It's the same thing. Both of those have to be filed within six months from the end of your fiscal year. And then you can see, of course, each of those have their own statute regarding that. So again, we do need all of those types of reports from you. The biggest one, of course, would be your tax levy because that's how you get your taxing dollars. So I know that I said original signatures and seals. Well, new development. Per Public Act 102-0625, districts can now file their tax documents electronically. Yes, you heard that right. You can file all of your taxing documents electronically. That does include your budget, your tax levy, your financial reports, your treasurer's reports. You can file them electronically. So you can send those to us via email in a PDF format to the tax extension at McHenryCountyIL.gov. As the county, we limit the size of documents coming into the county. I believe it is 20 megabytes, so it's very small size. Obviously, financial reports tend to be bigger than that. So we do have ShareFile. We will use ShareFile for bigger reports. If you need that link, then you go ahead and email us again at the tax extension at McHenryCountyIL.gov. We'll go ahead and email you that link to submit your documents. We will not be posting that on the website because we don't want people to send reports that are not intended for us. We do get a lot of calls about the circuit clerk, and we don't want people to think that's an access point for them to file their documents for their circuit clerk. So if you do need the share file link, then let us know. We'll go ahead and send it to you. Other than that, yep, you can go ahead and send any other report that you got. It has a report in the name. You can send it electronically. What we need from you too, the biggest one is going to be that first one, annexations and disconnections. This is the one we have the most issues with because it does have to be filed technically in two different offices. Filed with us the county clerk's office and recorded in the recorder's office. And this is all by state statute. So each location does have to have a document. Obviously with us, we are free. You don't have to pay us anything to record that or file that with us. But for the recorder's office, yes, there is a fee and you'd have to contact them with how you can pay that fee. What must accompany an annexation or disconnection? Well, we need a map and legal description. It's 100% required because the state will not process them without a map. We've tried to send them in the past without a map and they've denied them. So that is why we need that map. Other thing that some people don't know about annexations or disconnections these must be approved before your district's levy to be included in the current taxing cycle. If it is approved after your levy, then those annexations won't go into effect until next taxing cycle. Therefore, make sure if you want that annexation to be part of your current taxing year that you pass them before your levy. There's actually case law that dictates this matter so it has gone to court over this. So that is 100% ruled out that you need to have those done before your levy. Then we move on to new districts. New districts are probably going to be SSAs or special service areas. I don't expect new school districts or fire departments to pop up anytime soon. But if they did, then you'd have to follow the exact same rules. Must be filed with the county clerk's office and again recorded in the recorder's office. That's just state law. Again, need a map and legal description because the state won't process them without a map. And so you need to give me a map. Preferably the maps that you include would be eight and a half by 11. If you give me one of those big mylar 
I have no way of really making a copy of that because I have to make a copy of that to send it to the state. So if you could do 8.5 by 11, that'd be great. If you prefer to do the Mylar because that's just how you guys, you know, paid for those annexations to get done, that's fine. But if you could send me an 8.5 by 11 PDF to our email just so we can easily give that to the state um, because, again, I don't have a way to make a copy of the giant Mylar. Then bonds. New bonds need to be executed by March 1st in the year of extension and filed with the county clerk's office no later than March 15th. March 15th day is really just to keep us on track to make sure that we do extension in a timely manner and also get those bills out so you can get your first distribution. Then bond abatements and other district abatements. Again, filed no later than March 15th in the year of extension. Again, just to keep us on time. You know, keep us on track so that we get the bills out in a timely manner and that you get your distributions. So other district abatements, what could those be? Well, they could be levy abatements. Some districts decide to do levy abatements after they've issued their levy. There is now um, certain funds that could also be abated. Any abatements that you want, March 15th, please. Try to resist. I know it's tempting to file everything with us. However, we ask that you only file necessary documents with the clerk's office. We are limited on space and we only keep taxing documents for seven years after the date of completion, with the exception with annexations and disconnections. We keep those for forever. But if you could please try not to file your holiday schedules with us, your promotion resolutions, um, different policy resolutions that you have with your taxing district. We don't need those and we only keep them for seven years if you do file them with us. If that's something that you want a permanent record of, then I suggest recording those with the recorder's office because they're going to keep that for forever. You pay a fee for a purpose. But again, if you want something permanently filed with the county, we're not the best place to do it. Because again, after seven years of its issue date or effective date, it gets destroyed from our archives. Um, so we would no longer have that document. So when you come and you ask for documents from us, more than likely we're only gonna have the last seven years of taxing documents. We're not gonna have any of your taxing documents from like the 80s or the 70s or the 60s. So we only keep the last seven years, which sometimes doesn't help you as much. But if there's something that's very, very important that is kept on record and you don't want it to be lost within your own taxing district because sometimes people coming in and leaving for different positions could cause an issue, um, go ahead and record it in the recorder, recorder's office. What's new? So it's not exactly new new, but it only happened last year. So it's Fund 200. Most of you have seen this on your levy confirmations and your tax computation reports. So it's a revenue recapture fund. And it was created specifically because of Public Act 102-0519, or if you formerly knew it as SB 508. So it's specifically for districts that had loss in collection because of PTAB or other decisions. And if you are one of those districts, then you're going to receive a credit for the next taxing year. So what is a PTAB adjustment? So it's specifically a Board of Review adjustment, meaning maybe Bob is a homeowner, he owns property in your district, he lives on that property, and so he's entitled to a homestead exemption. Maybe he forgot to apply for it or didn't notice that it had fell off. So he notices that after extension, once he gets his tax bill, he notices, wait a minute, I'm not getting my homeowner's exemption. So then he takes his tax bill and brings it up to the county. County goes, oh yeah, you were supposed to have a homeowner exemption. Our bad, we'll go ahead and put that on there. So now they've now made an adjustment after extension. So when you first did your extension with your levy, when we did the calculations, we were thinking Bob didn't have a homeowner exemption. Therefore, we didn't account for that loss. Now Bob has the homeowner exemption. So we applied too much of your levy to Bob because he didn't, in our case, have that exemption. Now that he has an exemption, we don't have a way to take that amount of money that you're losing and distribute it to the other people because the tax bills have already been created. So that's a loss in collection. So those are the types of credits that you're going to be receiving the following year. And who's entitled to this revenue recapture? That's any district that is subject to PTEL. So if you're a PTEL district, it's automatically given to you. You don't have to request it. The numbers are certified to us by the treasurer's office in November, and that's like November 15th. 
And once that's done, then we input it into our system and then we go ahead and post it on our website. We're gonna post it on our website as soon as possible, but if you don't look at our website, you're probably gonna see it on Levy Confirmation. So you don't ask for it, anything like that. If you don't want the revenue recapture, then you're more than welcome to abate it. That's an amount that you can abate. We need a letter of ordinance just directing us to do that. Biggest question we've had with this is, is that amount included in my aggregate extension base for that year? No, it's not because it's already in there. This is a loss in collections, meaning when we did the extension, we thought that's what that was going to be. Your extension was 100%. So if we extended a million dollars, that's what you should have gotten was a million dollars. So your extension and your distribution are two different numbers. Your aggregate extension base is based off of what was extended, not collected. So it would already be in there. So we're not gonna add it again because that means you're getting two and then that won't work. Taxpayers would be very upset. So it's only one time because it's already in there. Next thing that is new, it's very new, it's the first time, adjusted aggregate base created because of Public Act 102 dash 0895 or if you knew it before SB 1975 so this is not for everybody but again it is a PTEL issue who can get it specifically school districts that are in recognition or review status with ISBE or Illinois State Board of Education park districts library districts community colleges again only if you're PTEL and school districts, all of our school districts are in recognition with ISBE. So any school districts in McHenry County can go ahead and do this. How do you say that you want your aggregate extension base to be adjusted? That's going to be with you certifying no later than 60 days after the filing of your original levy that you are not levying the max allowed for the current tax year. Meaning if you know that your district can extend a million dollars, 100%, it's gonna be a million dollars, but you've only extended $900,000, then you would file a letter with us with your levy or 60 days after stating that, that you are under levying your max extension. And so what that is going to do is then create a memo in our system stating for your aggregate extension base for, we'll say 2022, instead of $900,000, it's gonna be a million. So when you go and you look at your PTEL worksheets next year, so for 2023, you're going to see your aggregate extension base at a million dollars instead of the $900,000 that you actually extended. So that's what that's actually doing. It's bumping up your aggregate extension base if you don't levy your max. So it's not penalizing you for doing a lower levy. So that's what those are specifically. And again, it's only for those four different types of districts, only if you're PTEL and you do have to file within um, 60 days of your levy letting us know. So it just could be like a certified letter um, or just a letter on your letterhead or if you wanna do an ordinance through your board, if you want your board involved, that's fine as well. We just need direction that you acknowledge you know, that you're not max um, levying what you could. The way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. That's what Walt Disney said. However, I'm going to talk a little bit more about your extension team. Most of you know me, I'm Brittany Duffy. That is my phone number directly underneath my name. That's my extension directly to me. Uh, the office number is the exact same number except it's 4242. Or we have our second in command here is a Stephanie Vasquez. That's her direct line. And then we have one shared email. Obviously, we have our own individual emails, but for taxing purposes, we would prefer that you use tax extension at McHenryCountyIL.gov because, again, that's an email that both of us are looking at. If you send something to me and I'm not here, then I can't obviously see it. And then so can um, Stephanie cannot see it as well. So if you send everything to tax extension at McHenryCountyIL.gov, you have a better chance of one of us seeing it right away. Now the fun part. What is used to determine my district's extension? So we start off with, of course, your levy. The various taxing districts certify their levies by the last Tuesday in December of each year. Again, last Tuesday in December. I keep bringing it up because we have had people not turn them in by the last Tuesday in December. What does that mean if you don't turn it in by the last Tuesday in December? Well, 
you still need to turn it in because I don't have a way to backdate. I don't have a way to look at your prior year's levy to add it on to this year. There's nothing in the law that allows me to do that in any way. Some people think that I can, but I cannot. So you would get a fat zero. It'd be a zero amount. If you are late, you still need to turn it in. But if you are late, what does that do? We accept it. Please still include your certifications and things like that. But if you're late, you're opening yourself up to a tax objection, meaning John from down the street can go ahead and open up a court case against you because you did not follow statute. What would result in you turning in a late levy and somebody objecting? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what a judge would rule stating, you know, if you're a day late or two days late, what a judge take away every taxing dollar. I can't see them doing that, but that's up to them. It's up to what case law that they've seen on the matter, uh, what they decide. They're the big, you know, chief in charge of that. I have no authority to influence them in any way. So I'm not sure. So let's just avoid the whole situation by turning in your levies by the last Tuesday in December. Moving on, what do we use next is certified EAVs. So as stated, county assessors will certify all of its EAVs to us, so equalize assessed values for the various taxing districts. So that's every parcel, every property within your taxing district accumulated minus any exemptions or underassessed. That's what we're getting from them. And we're gonna get that probably around the first week of March. And as you've noticed, in the past, McHenry County was one of like the last counties to go ahead and send you anything with regards to extension until probably like late March. I don't know. All of a sudden we're getting, you know, it done quicker. So probably you're seeing us now as McHenry County being the first ones to give you numbers. So we are going to go ahead and send those to you. And then if you have overlapping values because you're in two different counties, we would also wait until we get certified values from them if we can if we cannot then we would use prior year EAVs from that county and then next year you'd get a prior year adjustment meaning you'd either probably get money taken away if we're the first one doing the certification um, there would be that adjustment next year then district abatements district abatements would be like bond and levy abatements again we want them to be received no later than the 15th of March of every year just because keep us on track. Keep us on track to get the extension done in a timely manner and then we get the tax bills out and then you get your distributions. So we start out with your levy and we enter it into a database. Each fund listed in your levy should have a corresponding fund that is contained in our system. If a fund is listed within your levy and not in our system, you may not be able to levy that fund a representative from our office will contact you to discuss. So you might have certain ones that um, require a referendum or they could have a uh, subject to backdoor referendum, meaning you did pass a referenda and you got that fund on your district, but you haven't levied for it within like three years. If that has happened and it's one of those funds, you would have to go back to the voters and ask if you can have that fund again. Then there are funds that you've added and potentially have not levied for in quite some time. They might not be subject to backdoor referendum, which means if you levied for it one time in your life, then you can add it any time later on. It doesn't matter even if it was from 1978, which we've had recently. So if you have a fund that you levied in the past and you have questions about it to add it back on, go ahead and reach out and we'll go do some digging on it. Um, preferably to have proof that you've levied for it. Our systems only go back so far, uh, specifically in the database and our, you know, system in our programs. We only go back to like 2007 because that's when we changed over to the program we have, which is DevNet. Before that, we have SidNet and we don't have any database on that anymore. Everything's been merged over that could be into DevNet. We have some old printouts from SIDNET, but that's not really helpful too much, um, especially if you levied for the funds last in you know anywhere before the 90s. We do have some handwritten documents on like 1992 and up, but again, that's you know not super long ago when you think about it. Um, so again, if you have a fund that you know that you levied for a long, long time ago, but you want to add it back in. Just do your due diligence to see if you have any record of it 
and then you know we'll go ahead and look at that just something that we can both feel comfortable on adding that back in if you can't find anything then it's really up to you as a taxing district you know if you go ahead and you add a fund and there's no proof that that fund existed then that could potentially be a tax objection and you're then going to have to have somebody you know provide proof if that goes to the court so just cover all your bases. If you have a fund and you want us to look into it, we'll go ahead and look into it for you. So once that levy is entered, then the extension process can really begin. So what data do we specifically look at for extension purposes calculation? We use the highest prior three extension for the past three years. And again, that's gonna now be adjusted if you are one of those districts with the adjusted aggregate base. Um, so we will go ahead and take that into account as well, but that's not gonna really take effect until next year, 2023, because 2022 is the first year that you can actually even do that certification of not levying your max. Then we use certified EAV from county assessor and again, overlapping county EAV. So again, if us as McHenry County are, have our certified values before another county, and we only give like a week and a half for our extension process, meaning when we send out tax computations to you and all of the other PTEL reports, we ask that you have everything turned back into us within like a week and a half. So if your overlapping county doesn't have their numbers out yet, then we're gonna use prior year numbers. And then the next following year, you're gonna get a prior year adjustment. Again, it's probably gonna be from our side a negative because we're probably gonna overextend on our side in McHenry County. Because if we use our current EAVs and we're using prior year EAVs from a different county, obviously we've had growth and we're accounting for it, but the prior year EAVs from the other county don't have the new growth, don't have the inflation, don't have any of those numbers adjusted into it. So what's gonna look like us as McHenry County has a way higher EAV than your overlapping other county. So you're gonna probably see a negative on our side for the following year, meaning like $1,000 or so. So if we have a $1,000 negative on our side, we're taking $1,000 back because our citizens paid too much in taxes. And then on the other county that you're with, you should see that $1,000 credit because their citizens did not pay enough taxes. So it does balance itself out. Um, it's not like you're going to be losing out on money. It's just that we give money, we take it back. It's just the process that we have to do because of different counties and how they certify and when they certify. Then we have certified state issued values, which include the CPI or cost per living, multiplier, railroad values, pollution parcels, and percent of burden. Pollution parcels, people have asked, what are those? Um, it's specifically for parcels that cause pollution. Specifically, there's ones for like dairy farms or dairy distribution or processing plants. Those ones, um, they're pollution parcels and they're certified to us by the state. It's very low amount. So that's up to the state who decides it's a, you would apply with a permit to them and then you pay your pollution parcel. Um, pollution parcel, don't bring in a lot of revenue it's a very low amount i want to say it's like two dollars here ten dollars there they're very low amounts but they're determined by the state and then percent of bur percent of burden so percent of burden some people go what is that i don't have that that's only if you have two counties that you're in if you're in a dual county um, so mchenry county and another county and percent of burden that's something that re is requested by the taxing district specifically to the Illinois Department of Revenue meaning you request the Illinois Department of Revenue to calculate who's responsible for what by percentage so the state could say that us as McHenry County we're responsible for 60% of your entire levy while another county is only responsible for 40% so it's a percentage that they've deemed each county is responsible for your levy and those calculations are again done through the Illinois Department of Revenue. It's not us. So if you have questions on that calculation, then I suggest that you talk to them. When do we get those values? Well, that's gonna be like in January, like mid-January to like early February is when the state sends those to us. But again, those are purely done by the taxing district. If you don't wanna be a percent of burden district, then you need to talk to them to get out of that. Next up is reports. So the reports that you can see right here are found on our website. It's specifically under the cycle photo. There's a photo of the taxing cycle with different photos and pictures. Um, these are what you're gonna be using to determine your levy or calculate what you wanna do. 
So the very first one you're going to notice is estimated EAV report. So this is going to take place of those planning projection sheets that you used to get. The planning projection sheets used to be sent out by the county assessor's office. They are no longer going to send those ones out specifically. And since we're posting the estimated EAV report, which is what they would give to you in its replacement, they're not going to send those out either. They're just going to direct you to our website. So on our website, we do have the estimated EAV report, which is what you're going to use to determine your levy. It's the same exact values that you would get on the planning projection minus the extension. So the calculations that they used to do on there, it's not on there. Um, it's just your resetting EAV and new construction values. With new construction values, those are not available until your township certifies its tax rolls and then those tax rolls can be signed off by assessments. So they're going to be on some reports, zeros. So new construction is going to be zero on your report. And if you know 100% you've had this whole new subdivision come up, it's probably because your township hasn't certified yet or the assessor's office is still in the process of balancing those. So if you see a zero on your new construction and you know 100% you're supposed to have new construction value, then it's probably going to be included in a later updated report. We do update the report you know, periodically. Like right now, this one says it's May 20th of 2022. It's been updated again already, I think twice since that date. So there is an updated report on our website. And then once we get the tax rolls from the townships, the assessor will let us know, and then once they're completely done on their side, they're going to let us know, and then we'll update the report and put it on our website. Um, if you want to know where the assessor stands on the tax rolls, in the report or the look of this report on our website right now, under the estimated EAV report, there's a little blurb, and then there's a click here to check on the tax roll status. So you can click on that. It's just, it's not updated on here because of a presentation was made before that update. But if you go to our website now, there is a little link on this report alone stating, click here to go look at the assessment rolls. Next would be prior year adjustment. Prior year adjustment, this is just gonna be for districts that overlap in multiple counties. And this is specifically if McHenry County uses our current EAV, but by the time we do extension, your overlapping county hasn't given updated EAVs, so we're using prior year. So that's what this prior year adjustment's gonna be. We always have this report because we overlap into Cook County or we have districts that overlap into Cook County, and Cook County doesn't do their extension until August. Very lucky of them. So we're always gonna have an adjusted report because Cook County doesn't do extension until August and we don't get their numbers until August. Then we have prior year extension listing. So this is going to be 100% accurate for this year. Um, that is including that adjusted aggregate base because that doesn't really go into effect until next year. The first year you're going to actually see an adjusted base would be 2022. So that would be the extension of 2022. So for this year, this taxing cycle of 2022, we are using the three prior year extensions. So we are gonna use 2021, 2020, and 2019 to determine your aggregate extension base for extension for 2022. So then you're not gonna actually see that adjusted aggregate until next year because 2022 is not, we're not using that as a base because it's not, it's not available yet. Next report we're gonna be looking at is consumer price index. So this is the CPI or cost per living. So this is the second item in the PTEL worksheet. We'll show that at a later time in this presentation, how all of these numbers come together, but that's gonna be where that goes. It, is a, it does fall into the PTEL calculation. For this year, it's very high considered to like last year's and the years before, uh, it's 5%. Last year it was 1.4%. So meaning 5% more than what you, your highest extension of the last three years, is what you can potentially get. Plus, you know, there's also the adjustment for new property and things like that. But yeah, it's 5% this year. The rule is 5% or whatever's lowest. So this year, it actually was calculated out to be 7%, but it's capped at 5. So that's where you're going to see your consumer price index. Next, we have percent of burden. Again, we kind of went over what percent of burden is. It's just a percentage, uh, percentage deemed by State Board of uh, uh, Illinois Department of Revenue. So Illinois Department of Revenue determines the percentage that us as McHenry County is responsible for 
your levy. Those don't get to us until like January, like mid-January, early February. So that's when those are going to come in to our office. State multiplier, we don't get the final multiplier until April. That's when we actually get the final multiplier. So that report won't go up there until after extension. The state multiplier tentatively for this time is one. We get that typically, I think, like in December. Um, so that is the tentative multiplier right now is one, and we don't typically have a change. So we operate under the assumption that it's going to be one. So all the time when we're sending out your documents in March and things like that, we're under the assumption that the one is going to remain. If for whatever reason the one changes to something else, under one, above one, then we're going to go ahead and reach right back out to you and send you all the documents again. So we're just operating under the what if thing. It's one. We think it's one. Where are these reports? Again, they're on our website. They're on our website. This column opens up on its own. It's already up there. It's right underneath the extension timeline photo. Um, this is where you're going to go ahead and find all of those different reports. More reports. Yes, lots and lots of more reports. So under that, you'll see tax extension reports. So this is one of the different like accordion things that you can open up. Tax extension reports, it's going to be all the prior year extension reports. So we always put our county P-Tax 250 summary report on there because a lot of people do use that for basically transparency and also just questions on the county and how we all of the districts do extension. Then we do district rates by tax code. It's just what the rate is by the tax code. District value within tax code, it's again by tax code, and then it just has the EAV in there. So some of these reports kind of repeat information and then include slightly different information. Um, it depends on which one you're really looking for. Some people prefer one over the other, therefore we just kind of post them all. Then we do equalized assessed value. So this is a revalue that report that we're going to have after assessment certifies to us. So obviously when you do your levy, you're not going to have that report available. You're going to use the estimated above, so the one that's in the quick access reports. Then we have prior year adjustment. It's the exact same report that's going to be up top. Non-ad valorem SSA district summary. So what that is is a non-ad valorem, or some of you know it as flat fee, meaning those are the SSAs that you tell us specifically what each parcel owes. Meaning parcel one, you say owes $1,000. Parcel two owes $500. Parcel three owes $2,000. You're letting us know each parcel, what that number is, and how much they need to contribute to that SSA. So those are ones that are completely different. They don't get, um, they're not ad valorem. They're not based off of value of the house. They're based off of what you've told us that parcel owes. Tax code detail within district. Then we have tax code values by district. Tax computation report all. Those are ones that you see all the time. It's just going to be put up there with a final on there. It's going to be final word on there. It's literally the same thing that you get, but with the word final in front of it. TIF district tax extension. So that is actually kind of a breakdown. On the tax computation reports, you do see TIF district extension, but the TIF district tax extension report is the specific districts that are feeding into that district, the TIF district. So how much money would McHenry County College 528 get? That's how much it's going to the TIF district. And then we have drainage district extensions. So this is newer this year, as you can see last year. It wasn't there. This was a requested ex uh, report to have up on there, so we did put that on there. So if you have any report that you can think would be a really good report to keep up here for you or anything that you kind of want to see, we can go and see if we have that report um, or we can kind of reach out to our developer to see if that's a report that's really easily made or things like that, then we'll put that on there. So drainage district extensions is just what their extension was because nowhere on, on these other reports does it show the extension. So that's why that's on there. But if you have a report that you think your district would benefit or other districts would benefit from, let us know and we'll go ahead and try to put it on the website. So prior year extension listing. This is what we use to determine your district's aggregate extension base and what it will be. So as you can see right now above, 2020 was the highest extension. That's simply what it is. We do anything that's not capped, so any bonds and things would be excluded. So capped funds only, and then that would include any overlapping capped funds as well extension. That's what we're using to determine your aggregate extension base. Again, 
if you are one of those districts for the adjusted aggregate extension base, then this report won't be accurate for next year, especially if you take advantage for, of that certification. Um, then next year, there will probably be a report right underneath it on our website stating for those districts specifically. But as you can see, 2020 is the highest of those three years. So we're going to use that for our example. The next value in consideration with extension is your rate setting EAV, which you can see below. As you can see, rate setting EAV for this district of Village of Bridget is $46,164,915. So that is the amount after board of review and exemptions, under assessed, state assessed, state multiplier, and then any TIF increment or enterprise zone. That is the number that we would be using for the calculations for PTEL purposes. And again, under assessed, just to let you know, under assessed parcels are anything under 150 value. So if you have property out there that's under 150 value, they don't get a tax bill and they're not included in the extension. So those could be like vacant lots, things like that. Um, could also be like houses that are no longer, you know, habitable for human beings or anything other than that. So those are not included in your rate setting EAV. So it could be lower because of that. So next we're going to show you exactly where those numbers go. So the aggregate extension base and the current EAV. As you can see right here, this is the PTEL worksheet. Most of you know what this looks like because you're a PTEL district. If you're not a PTEL district, then you don't get this, but the calculations pretty much play out the same, except you're not limited by PTEL. So as you can see right there, current EAV is highlighted right there on that screen, the 46,164,915 right there under current EAV. Then as we saw before, the aggregate extension base is right there in line one and item one. This is where those numbers fit into the calculation. And then we start taking all the other values from. Other thing that was not pointed out um, specifically is the new property. So if you go to the third line in the second column, you'll see new property. That new property is going to be the number certified to us by the assessor and then that would be for you to find it on the estimated EAV it's going to be new construction it's the same thing new property new construction is the exact same thing just different word but that's where all of those numbers fit into and then CPI CPI is also going to be the first column second or first row second column which is that right now you can see 1.014 that was the CPI for last year. So last year was 1.4%. So for this year, you're going to see 1.05%. So that's what you're going to see. And then all those other numbers are if you have overlapping new property, TIF recovery, things like that. Uh, most cases, the districts don't because you're in one county. Calculating your district's limiting rate. So this is basically the PTEL calculation. Um, so you're going to take your aggregate extension base and you're going to multiply that by 1 plus the limit or CPI. So 100% plus whatever percentage of the CPI. So obviously 100% is 1. And then we have last year for 2020, 1, it was 1.4%. So this is using last year's info. So then we have 1.014. And then that would equal your numerator. Then we take your current EAV, which is determined from the equalized assessed value report. For you, you're going to be using the estimated report. And then we subtract any annexations plus any disconnections equal your adjusted EAV. So adjusted EAV then goes and subtracts any new property times the state multiplier. So the state multiplier at this point is a tenant of one. So that should be the same thing for this coming year. Then you subtract any overlap new property, any TIF recovery, any enterprise zone recovery, which then equals your denominator. So enterprise zone recovery, a lot of you are not gonna see that because we only have one enterprise zone in McHenry County and it's the one that's with Harvard, Marengo and Woodstock. Those are the only locations that have it, and there's only a slim area. Um, most of it is in actually Harvard area, but then there are some um, 
in Woodstock, of course, as well, and a little bit in Marengo. But if you're not in that area at all, there is not going to be enterprise zone recovery coming your way, unless you are in an overlapping one, an overlapping county that has enterprise zone recovery, you're probably not going to see it from us. And then TIF recovery. There are a lot of TIFs actually in McHenry County, so you could potentially have one of those. And TIFs run for 23 years, 23 extensions, um, depending on, it could be 24, depending on your interpretation of the law, based off of when you say the TIF starts, maybe by fiscal year, um, or some people interpret it as the number of extensions that the TIF has obtained. Up to you though. But we as the county clerk handle that and we do not delete any TIFs unless we are notified by the original taxing district to get rid of them. Meaning if a TIF is expiring, we have to have an ordinance from that taxing district to get rid of it. If they don't give us anything, then we can't get it off the books. It stays on the books and it will go ahead and levy for the next year. There is nothing in the law allowing me to get rid of it. Then if they, they continue not to get rid of it, that could potentially be a court case and that would be out of the county's hands, unfortunately. But back to the question at hand. So we'll take your numerator and we're gonna divide it by your denominator. And the good old math gives us this, your limiting rate but that's just a number we go ahead and we use a percentage uh, that's just how it's displayed and that's how the state does it with rates so how do we get a percentage we'll multiply that by 100 and here in McHenry county we round to the sixth decimal place so some different counties use like five or four we use six just because it's a better number it's easier for us to get more accurate to your actual extension or your request so now your limiting rate is 2.197065. So that's for this example, that's the limiting rate we've calculated. So finding your district's max extension. We get this question a lot. What is my district's max extension? What can I levy for, you know, for my levy? Like what can I go ahead and have go across my board and what can they approve? Well, what you can do is you can take the limiting rate that we just determined, which is right there, and you're gonna to wanna to multiply that by your current EAV, which again is for your purposes for the levying part is gonna be estimated. Um, unfortunately, that's just the way it goes because we don't get final numbers until March and your levies are due in December. But of course, with this, that's a percentage. So what we do is we have to then divide by 100 to get back down to a normal number. And once we do that, this is what we're gonna be left with. There's the normal number, multiply that by your current AAV. And here we are. Then we do some normal simple rounding. So the district can approximately levy or receive $1,014,273.19. That is the approximate amount that they're going to get. They could potentially get a little bit more, a little bit less. It really depends on the rounding and then the final numbers, of course, at the end. For this purpose, it is a current EAV, meaning that is the final number that this district is getting uh, without any obviously different um, prior year adjustments or PTAB decisions, but for normal purposes, that is the EAV that this district is using. Next up, calculating your requested levies rates. So this is gonna be the rates per fund. So what we're gonna start off with is we're gonna look at your funds. So each fund, you're gonna have its individual levy request. So we're gonna determine a rate specifically for each request. So how we do that is we take your levy request, so in this example, $205,000 specifically, and divide that by your current EAV. So the current EAV, again, is gonna be your rate setting EAV minus any exemption, things like that. So anything that can be taken out of it will be taken out of it. So we'll take the levy request of $205,000 and divide it by your current AAV, but then we want a percentage because that's just the look of how rates are with the state and everything like that. So what we're gonna then do is we're gonna multiply that by 100 to get that percentage. So once we take, again, each levy request amount divided by current AAV, multiply by 100, what we're then gonna end up with is this. This is gonna be your calculated rate. And your calculated rate is basically just as it is. What it needs to be to get that levy request. Then once we do that, we're gonna then look at any max rates. And max rates are set by the state. So Illinois Department of Revenue sets this. This is set by legislation that governs extension. 
So then we look and see, does any calculated rate go over a max rate? And as we can see right there, the very first line item, corporate. Corporate goes over that max rate, and max rates cannot be increased unless you have a referenda to increase them, and some of them don't go up. You can't just keep going up, 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 up. Um, so there is a final step for max rates. But as you can see from this example, the corporate amount is over that max rate. So what we're going to do is then we're going to have to limit. We're going to limit you. So on actual rate, it's limited to the max rate for corporate. Then every other rate should be the same because there's no max rate or we're under it. But you can see there's slight differences, specifically in the audit fund. So as you can see, the calculated rate for the audit fund was 0 0.108307. And then you look over at the actual rate, and the actual rate reads 0 0.108308. So it is slightly different, slightly up. And the reason why is because you requested $50,000. That's what you requested. If I were to use that rate with the seven in it, then you're not going to get the fully requested $50,000. You're probably going to get $49,999 and like 82 cents. But you didn't ask for that. You asked for $50,000. So then the system knows that. The system automatically increases it by one, and that's where you're getting that extra little oomph. Instead of a seven, you're at an eight because you got to get $50,000. So in the end, the levy request with extension is probably going to be $50,000 in like 82 cents. So there you go. You're getting your extra dollar and so. It's not going to be a huge increase, but it will be a slight increase. And then as you can see, the other funds, some of them are doing the same thing. They're increasing by one because of you need to get that $55,000, you need to get that $23,000. That's just how the system works. So we do check it just to make sure everything's calculating correctly, but that's why you're seeing slight differences. And then, of course, we have the formula for you there at the very bottom, in case some of you like to have the formula instead of us just talking the formula to you. So there is the printed formula for you. Calculating non ptel extensions. So this is for any district that is not part of ptel. This is what you're going to be using. Um, so how you're going to know what you're going to be getting from our county. Every district does get this extension or this calculation. So what we do is we take your actual rate and we multiply that by your current EAV. But of course, that's actual rate isn't a percentage. So then we have to divide everything by 100. It really doesn't matter which way you divide by 100, whether you take the actual rate divided by 100 or you take the current EAV divided by 100 or you take everything divided by 100. It doesn't matter which way you go. Um, I like to do actual rate, just kind of like reading a book, actual rate multiplied by current EAV divided by 100. Just left to right situation. And once you do all of that, then you will be getting the non ptil extension. We do normal rounding again, 50 cents. I can't give you 50 cents in like one. That does, uh, there's no way to give you that like weird penny. That's not a penny. So as you can see, the non ptil extension for corporate was $201,971.50. Uh, we do traditional rounding, which is anything five and up goes up, anything four and below goes down. So that's where you're losing pennies here and there, things like that. And as you can see, the total extension will be $122,497.93. or $1,022,497.93. Because we don't have any bonds, we don't have anything that's not capped, things like that. So if you have the revenue recapture, then it will be there. It will be in the non-capped part of it. Some of you will see the revenue recapture, but a zero value. That's because your district is very small in our county. Um, it's primarily, there's a few school districts really that are very tiny. You don't have a lot of people. So if there weren't any PTAB adjustments or other adjustments in the last year, then from those people, that are under your district, then you're not going to see a revenue recapture because none of your constituents or none of your um, taxing district folks actually made a request to have an adjustment. So there's our non ptel extension, and then there's a formula for it. So we do typically try to put up the formula out there for you so you can go ahead and see how we're doing it. Actual rate versus limiting rate. So actual rate, we just determined what it was. We could, you can see actual rate is with any state max 
limits and then with a little bit of rounding to make sure that you're getting your full levy. So as you can see, what we determined, your actual rate based off of your levy request and your EAV, uh, the total is 2.214881. So that is the actual rate to get you what you requested. But if you remember in a few slides back, your limiting rate was calculated. And when we calculated that rate, we only got 2.197065. So as you can see, your actual rate is higher than your limiting rate, meaning you have to then now be adjusted back down to your limiting rate. So how do we do that? What is the calculation for that? So specifically what we do is we take your limiting rate that we calculated and we divide that by your actual rate or computed rate, depends on which report you look at. Those are the same exact thing. Once we do that, then we get the reduction factor or p-tail factor. And again, it's the same thing, just re different reports call it different things. So this is a reduction rate that we would then apply to each fund rate to then get it back down to only total your limiting rate. So that's what we would do equally. And then of course, there's the formula for that. So you can go ahead and that's the formula that we've just used. So some people go, oh, I don't want my funds to be reduced. I 100% need my corporate rate to be the max that I can have it because all my bills come out of there. Perfectly fine. When we send out the PTEL reallocation worksheets, then you can indicate that on there. You can go ahead and like bump that rate back up to what you want it to be. Then you just have to determine what other rates are going to be hitting, you know, taking the hit. So you're going to have to either evenly distribute the difference for the other funds or take that out from one fund, more than one fund. Up to you. That's up to you how you want to do that. If you have questions on how you calculate all of that um, or just questions if this is going to work, then you can let us know and we'll go ahead and look it over. And if there's anything, you know, out of place, then we'll let you know and we'll tell you what the next step is to remedy it. But yes, we automatically just do an even reduction to each fund. So if you're perfectly fine with that, then go ahead and just sign off on the tax computation report at that time because that's what we're doing. We're just doing even reduction. So that's how you, we calculate the reduction factor for over extended districts. So once we determine that PTEL factor, then how do we apply that to your rates? So calculating limited rates. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take your actual rates, those are the ones that were determined from your levy and then your EAV, minus any, of course, adjustments for max um, rates from the state. Then we're gonna multiply that by the reduction factor that we just determined. So there's that 0 0.991956. So each rate is evenly multiplied by that reduction factor. So each rate gets redu reduced evenly. Again, if you don't want that, then you just have to let us know on the PTEL reallocation, and then we can change it out. You know, we can go ahead and take the overage from a different fund or multiple funds. So once we apply the PTEL factor, then that's gonna equal your limited rate. So this is just straight across. So we're just doing the multiplication straight across. This is an even reduction. Once we do that, we're gonna get down to your limited rate. And then of course, there is the formula for the actions we just took. And that's how we simply just do the limited rate. Next up is percent of burden. So not every district, again, is gonna have this. Percent of burden is really only for districts that overlap. And those districts specifically that overlap and have requested percent of burden being determined by the Illinois Department of Revenue. So as again, we get the certification from the state. It's just a percentage of how much McHenry County owes of your levy. And we get that certification from the state typically around like January. So like, as you can see in the top right hand corner, we got last year's certification January 17th of 2022. So this next year coming up, we're probably going to get it around the same time, if not maybe a little bit closer to February, depending on where the state's at. So for this example, we're just going to do one, one line item. So we're going to do corporate. So we're going to go ahead and say that the corporate fund, the state has determined that us as McHenry County owes 89% of it. So we are responsible for 89% of that burden of that levy. So simply all we do is take the levy request and multiply it by 89%. So 89% of $205,000 is $182,450. So that's what we, as McHenry County, owe you as a taxing district. So we just start the process all over again, simply exactly how we did before. We took your levy request, so this is your percent of burden adjusted levy, and we're going to divide that by your EAV. 
Then we're going to multiply that by 100 because percentages. Then we're going to multiply that just because we're going to keep doing all the steps we've already done prior. And so we're going to multiply that by the p-tail factor. So the p-tail factor still exists in our life because you're over, you've overextended. And then that will equal our new rate. So that is our percent of burden rate. What we do is then we go ahead and put that back in to the line item where you can see above says percent of burden rate. We'll go in there. And once we do that, then we would just take that percent of burden rate and then multiply that right back into your EAV. And that will get us a McHenry County extension, which you can see is $180,982.16. So that's what we would give you as McHenry County for a percent of burden and then also being limited by a P-tail factor. So P-tail factor still applies to percent of burden 100% just because you've overextended. Calculating P-tail limited extension. So what we've already done is we've determined what your actual rate was, then we saw what your non-P-tail extension was, then of course we determined that your non-P-tail extension was too high for your limiting rate, so then we did the p-tail reduction factor and what we did is we applied that p-tail reduction factor to your actual rate which then gave us your limited rate so the next step we do is we take your limited rate and then we're going to multiply that by your current eav but this limited rate is in a percentage so what we're going to do to get everything you know an actual dollar amount is we're going to divide your limited rate by 100 so we'll do limited rate multiplied by current eav and then divide the whole thing by 100 there's that hundred. Once we do that, then we're going to go get the dollar amount round up to this, the normal change, two decimal places. So as you can see, there is a McHenry County extension. So for the very first fund, corporate, $200,346.96. We add them all up. We can see our total is $1,014,273.18. And if you remember slides before, slides, slides, slides before, that our estimated max extension was going to be $1,014,273.19. So we are a penny off. Lost a penny somewhere. Sometimes you gain a penny, sometimes you lose a penny, but maybe you'll find one on the sidewalk. But that is the extension that you would get from McHenry County before any loss in collections, but that is what we extend. We don't account for loss in collections because we don't know if that's going to happen. So that's what you're going to get from us. And then, of course, there is the formula in case you would like to see it. Some people just, again, like that formula for their viewing. Other than that, that's how we get that limited extension. That finishes up tax extension. So thank you so much for following with us today. As you can see, there is our email address if you have any questions. So we prefer that you would use tax extension at mchenrycountyil.gov. There is our website. Our website is very long to get to our reports, but if you just go to the county website and go to under county clerk and then taxes and tax extension, that's where you're gonna go ahead and find that, or you can type in that URL 100% the way that it is there and you'll get to that page. All of the reports that we talked about in this presentation will be there as well along with any questions as well, um, frequently asked questions for taxpayers and also taxing districts. There is a spot for you there as well with timeline. So if you have any questions, certainly reach out to us. Other than that, thank you all for following along and have a good day.